There was a man by the name of Lecky who after endeavoring with the use of the scientific method in the field of psychology informed us that there is very little, if any, change. His theory is called the theory of self-consistency. For he had observed that in the life of persons, once the habit patterns are in place, that a man does very little, if any, changing in his entire lifetime. That, of course, is what is apparent. The truth of the matter is that only God changes not. In Malachi, we find that God is a God who never changes. And that in itself is a fact of hope today for you and for me. Not only does God not change, but the second person of the Trinity is the same. In the book of Hebrews, we find that Jesus is the same yesterday, yesterday today, and forever. And that is a fact of encouragement for us today. Divinity never changes. God never changes, or He would not be God. In His attributes and in His character, if you can use that word, mostly uh, we use that word in, of um, man, of God, of attributes, we find that He is full and complete in everything and does not change. Perhaps then we should correct something. Change really is going on all of the time. But most change is not a change for good. It is a change for the worse. You that are students of physics know that the second law of thermodynamics has to do with the law of change. That we are in the process of changing all of the time but it is not a change for the better. The moment a man is born, that man begins to die. That is a fact of life. And it is a change from health unto no health. It is a change from life unto death as far as the physical body is concerned. It is a fact of life. The second law of thermodynamics as far as its intensity is concerned, is noted, known as the law of enthropy. And it means that in the change of from one energy pattern to another, things are not changing from disorder to order, but rather from order to disorder. I illustrate from Compton's Encyclopedia. A jar of black grains, granules, a jar of white granules. You mix them together. It takes very little energy to mix them. But in order to restore them to their original state, it takes a lot of energy. In fact, uh, without some highly mechanized process to separate the two chemically, you would have to take a tweezers and uh, and uh, and exp to expend energy moment after moment after moment. Probably would take hours and days to restore the white to white and the black to black. That's why we find that housekeeping is difficult. And the lack of housekeeping is not so difficult. One, another illustration that I found was if you throw your shoe off in your, in your uh, bedroom, it simply somehow does not automatically land in the closet. Order and the restoration of order is difficult because everything is working from order to disorder. I have an Oldsmobile that's two years old. A new one is on order. Why? Why? In two years' time, an excellent eleven to $12,000 car is now becoming disorderly. 
There are rust spots. The uh, pistons are not as good as they once were. Tonight when I rode on the right seat, which is a power seat, I found it rocking. Something's come loose. We just restored several items, just got it out of the shop. Why did we have to put it in? Because there is a law called the second law of thermodynamics, a law called the law of entropy, which says that things are going from order to disorder all of the time. Now that's true for the material universe. And before I go to the spiritual uh, part of our life, I want to say this. That's why it's so hard for you and I to move upstream. That's why it's so difficult for us to discipline ourselves in terms of housekeeping or in terms of keeping the books or whatever it is. You have, you're waiting against the stream of a law called the second law of thermodynamics. To keep order takes energy and a lot more energy than to have disorder. You let things go and it becomes a mess real quick. You let things go in your life and it becomes a mess real quick because something happened in the Garden of Eden and that which happened started a process of thorns and thistles in your life and my life. And observably, as far as the spiritual eye is concerned, things are going from order to chaos and from order to disorder. And it takes a lot more energy to restore something than it does to let it go. If you let it go, it becomes great chaos and great disorder. That's one reason that Bertrand Russell, Bertrand Russell's uh, theory of man is so downright laughable. For he said that man is the product of chaotic cosmic forces. That's what, that's what an intellectual who's already gone out of this life, that's how, I, if I may say, that's how really silly a man can be. In spite of a known law, he has said, because it's an effort to have hope where there's no hope, because he didn't believe in God, that we... And this beautiful body, these eyes that can see and all this intricate mechanism that was within us, somehow this is simply the product of chaotic cosmic forces. Even a fool knows better. But professing ourselves to be wise, we refuse to acknowledge God. And when we do it, we, ch we, change, we change what God has proved of Himself. We change that image and we make it something corruptible. Paul talks about it in Romans 1. I'm very much stirred today over the hopelessness that's in the world. Rodney has shared with me that the leading men of philosophy are no longer men of hope, but they are men who have acknowledged the reality of life. That is, if you see life without God, they are persons who have said there is no hope the leading thinkers of the world today acknowledge that there is no hope because if you reject the presupposition of God, of a creator, of someone who can change this whole thing, the honest answer is there's no hope for you and there's no hope for me. But the incarnation tells me different. The incarnation tells me different. When Jesus entered this world, he started a movement upstream. When Jesus entered this world, he started against the forces that were put into play by the sin in the Garden of Eden. And he started bringing order where there's disorder. He started making, making beauty out of chaos. I'm telling you folks, it took, a, it took greater power than you and I could ever think of for what he ever did. He was declared to be the Son of God by the power of the resurrection. And the first time in history that there was ever a known change against this law was in the power of the resurrection because he did something. He changed death to life, and it's never been known to happen before. He went from death to life rather than from life to death. Mankind is moving one way from, chaos, from order to disorder. Mankind is moving one way from life to death. But when he came, he changed everything. 
That's the hope of the incarnation tonight. When he came, he came as the son of God. When he came, he came with a promise of order. When he came, he came with a promise of reversal for your life and for my life. The Bible it says itself says something when you look at the, that the Greek interpretation or a translation of good Greek. Good speed is translated from Revelation 22 to 11. Let the evildoer do worse and worse. Let the base grow baser and baser and baser. Let the upright man be more and more upright, and the man who is holy be more and more holy. The Scriptures themselves tell us of change. For you and I are in the process of becoming, but most of us, are in the process, all of us are in the process of becoming something worse unless, unless we have submitted ourselves unto God. Unless we have accepted the true, the fact of the incarnation. Unless we have accepted God in our life. And where does the first change begin? It begins at salvation. When you and I become born again, we become born again for a reversal. We, 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 we become soldiers that are against the stream. That's the story of Don Quixote. When I see, hear of Don Quixote, I hear of the man who wrote it, and I hear of something of the hope and the desperation of his own heart. And yet he knew, and it's funny how the world can write all these things, and the church gives so little appreciation to what they've written, because there's a deep hope, there's a deep cry. In the, in, the great, in the great works of literature, I know in recent times it is all of pessimism, that most all of pessimism, but back in the days of romance, back in the days of the Baroque period, back in some of the early days, even up to the 20th century, there was still that cry of hope that something can be done about all this. But humanism will never do it unless we let God into our life. Unless we submit ourselves into them, you and I are getting worse and worse. That's what's wrong with your marriages if they aren't given unto God. They do not go from disorder to order. It's against all known law. Rodney was surprised that I would bring this law over into the moral realm. But I, we find it's true and found the scripture for it. But he was, he was happy with it. He was thrilled with it. When God, when Jesus Christ came, the express image, the explicit, exact image of God, which is what Hebrews 1, 3 says, uh, he also brought the hope for us. That is a restoration to that same image. Not the exact image, but it, we would be in the process of becoming, which starts at conversion. There are two ways that I've seen men change. Now, I want to tell you something. I have never in my life seen very many men change. My heart is broken today over those of you who have been with me 10 years and have changed very little, if I, as far as I can see, observable change. But that doesn't mean that God's not real. That doesn't mean that you and I don't have a promise. And my heart has broken myself over the lack of change in my own life, but I still have a promise and I still have hope. And I know that the change begins by faith and conversion in my own life. There are two ways, conversion and sanctification. But most men will not submit themselves to the sanctifying work of God because that involves self-denial. We're in the process of becoming either better or worse by that which we have our attention upon and is on other than God, and that's the first commandment. To love the Lord, and this is the rationale for it. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're in the process of becoming like him. But anything else has our attention. Brother, we're on something that's going to make hell out of us before it's all over with. And I promise you that this is true. That's why Stephen is so stirred up. If men are more giving to hunting or fishing or recreation than they are to the preeminence of Christ, he knows that they're becoming worse in the process. He knows that though it may be a good thing, even trimming the yard, they're getting worse by the moment. It is a law. It is a fact. It is history. Brother, we preachers have been on our knees and cried our hearts out because we can't get, keep men to keep God in focus day and night. We know there's only one way to go. No man remains the same. Only Christ himself. 
Only God himself, the Holy Spirit, can remain the same and he's perfect. You and I have got to get better or we're gonna get worse. There's no other way to go. And we become what we love. And what has our attention is what we love. But if we love Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, the change is for the better. I use that scripture this morning, but I'm even happier with it tonight. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. Now we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we look at the Lord and as we love Him, we are changed. Can't you see that principle operating even in the life of a child? See, there are good principles involved in the life, godly principles in the life of the rearing of children on, on, on the part of most parents. And so that child tends to become like that parent. You see, it's not all bad or it would all fall apart. Most everything bad has a little good in it. That's the reason it stays together. But in the overall process, unless the focus is central, unless Christ is central, unless God is central, the final result is that of chaos and of that of hell. Observe it in the life of persons who grow old. Maybe their weakness is to be a little bit bickering or bitter when they're younger, but when they get older, they're worse. And oftentimes we've said that a man, <clears throat> that a person when he grows old either becomes sweeter or it becomes more sour. Whatever. It depends on what his focus is upon. I'm thankful for the promise that God has given us. For in Romans 8, it says that if you and I have been called or predestined, God has made a promise. And I'm standing on the promise because it is a promise of change tonight. And we know that all things work together for good. I like the 26th verse. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. Now listen to this. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, the firstborn among uh, many brethren. Moreover, I like this too, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then uh, uh, to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, <clears throat> but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? <clears throat> that is a scripture that tells me of change. That's a scripture that tells me that when God, when the plan of salvation came forth, the promise of change came forth for you and for me. Yes, we're in the process of becoming. We're either in the process of becoming better and better are in the process of becoming worse and worse. It depends on where our love is. You say, well, Brother Hogan, now wait just a minute. I know a lot of fine people. Dear ones, there is such a thing as refined carnality. There is such a thing as refined sophistication. But on the inside, it is putrid and getting worse and worse. Men don't have good sense if they don't put good manners on themselves. Men don't have good sense if they don't try to take, uh, uh, be good stewards of the things that God has given them. But the most important thing that a man can be given is his own person. And that takes the power of God to change. 
The trilogy of songs spoke of dream and spoke of change by persons who have written in the world. Only the church can offer them the fulfillment of their dreams. Only God can promise real change. When our Lord came to this earth almost 2,000 years ago, he reversed the law, the law from order to disorder. And in him, he made it from disorder to order. And it's a beautiful thing. Oh, I want to encourage you tonight to submit yourself unto God. I want to encourage you to think on, on those things and to focus your attention on those things which will really change your life. I want to encourage you most of all to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and keep him foremost and uppermost in the mind of all that you do and think. Whether it's recreation, remember the sermon that we preach on the sacramental universe. Tonight we've had a view of that. For we've used something from his universe that was good, though it was not strictly religious as such, but all oh, the message that it has in it. Could you feel the anointing of God when Michael was singing? Michael came, heard I was going to preach on change tonight, so he brought, he brought those songs to me, and the Holy Spirit was witnessing in just a little while. Especially did God touch my heart on the second song. Folks, what I've given you tonight is the hope of the incarnation. But that hope can only be realized unless the Word of God becomes flesh in yourself. Unless you are restored to the image of God. And remember, it be begins at conversion. But you must put off the old man. Paul made it very clear. Just to emphasize the point, maybe I should read Colossians 3 again to you. For the work of sanctification is also a part of the process of salvation. Let's look at the words of Paul before we leave this subject tonight. Colossians 3 says very plainly, listen to this before I give you the scripture. We want to keep in mind that we don't fall in love with God. We will ourselves to be in love with God. We've got the romantic notion that we fall in love with God. After you have willed yourself with God, after you've given yourself to God in faith, there is a falling in love period. After you find out how wonderful he is, after you find out how beautiful he is, there's, there's time to fall in love. But brother, let me tell you something. When your eternal destiny is at stake, it's a matter of willpower. You choose to love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind and strength simply with your will. You say, well, Brother Hogan, that sounds like a work your way to heaven. No, it's not. The willpower alone will not do it, but it opens up your life for him to do the work by grace. But he will not violate your willpower. He will not do it unless you will to love him and repent of your sins and remove from your focus the image of sin and self. It is always a work in your life, in your life of order to disorder from beauty to chaos, from life unto death. And only the power of Almighty God as revealed in the resurrection, as begun in the incarnation, can change your life and make it from worse to better. I'm thrilled with it, aren't you? It gives me hope in my heart. So remember, the kind of love I'm talking about is that which engages the will. It is right. It is proper. It's something we must do, but assisted by divine power when we will ourselves in our mind to focus our attention upon God. He will help us to read, pray, witness, obey, or whatever. And then he will do the work of grace within us. Paul said in Colossians 3, but now ye also, I'm reading in the eighth verse here, but now ye also put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, but have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all, Put on, therefore, 
as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. It makes everything run right. It gives you unity and diversity and causes you to appreciate one another's differences and with the oil of the Spirit makes everything complementary. I want to repeat myself. I have seen very little change in my lifetime. But that doesn't mean the change is not possible. God, nothing is impossible with God. If he can bring forth John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth, bring forth the Christ out of the womb of Mary supernaturally, if he can part the Red Sea, he can change your life and my life. But my friends, we have to stay in the fire of his refinement because you and I can voluntarily choose not to be placed there or submit ourselves. It's a great message. No change, no image. Oh, but wait a minute. Change always, either for the better or for the worse. The value of Pentecost can be seen in the fact of its great change. For 3,000 persons were converted in one day. God not only wants to change an individual life, but he wants to change the fellowship of our church to such a degree that there may be an outpouring of his spirit that may change masses of society. Let me tell you something, folks. Legislation won't do it. Doesn't mean I'm against it. In fact, legislation... Uh, riding our senators and influencing is very necessary, but it's something like a dog barking at a car. You may make it swerve, but you don't stop it. Evil that's in the heart of man cannot be stopped. Brother, this society is getting worse and worse and worse, and without an old-fashioned infusion of God's power through the church of the living God, there is no stopping this process. It is a law of the universe, but God can do it if he can find the people they will trust him with all, of his, with all of their hearts. That's why we're looking for Holy Ghost revival. We're trying to do our best to influence our legislators. We're trying to do our best to influence the president. The awful thing we have in Iran now means the breakdown of law, of international law. Well, not everybody respects law. Or do they agree on what you think law ought to be? But I know this, there is the law of love given by God himself that works for the betterment of the brethren and for the brotherhood of man. But that law goes against the very stream of humanity, the very stream of disorder. God can find a people who will wholly give themselves unto him. He can bring a revival that will be as great or greater than Pentecost where millions of persons, and I'm looking for that revival in the end time. I know it's a great end gathering, a great harvest, but it will be a reversal against disorder. At the same time, those who've chosen to go their evil way will wax worse and worse, but it need not be. There is hope. That's what the incarnation tells us. That's our hope in Christ. It's a great and it's a wonderful story. It's the only answer to Don Quixote's dreams. It's the only answer to the man who followed the man who had the dreams. But there was power enough in those dreams to transform the life of a person. Cervantes saw that. Where did that principle come from? It is a spiritual principle that works itself against the stream and the law of disorder. I need God's power in my life. I need changing. I need conversion. I need sanctification. I need fresh in feeling because the truth of the matter is unless I'm submitted to God and loving with all of my heart, I'm not getting better. I'm certainly not staying the same. It is an impossibility. I am getting worse and I don't want to be that way. I have a dream 
I can hear Martin Luther King say, I have a dream. I have a dream. My dream's even different than his, but he had a good dream. A dream where black men were as acceptable as white men. But I have a dream where the heart of man is changed so there won't even be a race problem. I have a dream where the, where the heart of man is so changed that there's such an infusion of moral power in the nations themselves until there would be the need for a very minimum of lawmaking. I have dream of a change. The kind of change that shuts the bars and shuts the taverns. The kind of dream that changes the barmaids as well as the man in the street. The kind of dream that makes uh, disorder, I mean order out of disorder. I have a dream too. But that dream can only be fulfilled in Christ Jesus and it is the glad message that I give you at Christmas time. It is Christmas, folks. And we have reason to celebrate. It is possible to change for good, but only God working in your life can do it. May God help us. May he change us here at Christmas time.